um, engage in what we call predatory pricing, which is basically they'll book your hotel. And if you have a liberal cancellation policy, they'll continue to shop for a better price. And of course, you know, in revenue management that uh, if they find that better price, they're gonna cancel your hotel and they're gonna book that better price. And so um, I call this predatory pricing. I think it's unfair because, you know, consumers can, 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 can make a, let's say a commitment to you or make a reservation and then get out of it just because they find a better price. Whereas <clears throat> I could never call a consumer and say, well, you know, Damien, you know, you made a reservation for me, my hotel tomorrow for a hundred dollars, but I found uh, Camilla is willing to pay 120. So I'm canceling your reservation. So um, I always thought that was an unequal relationship or unfair. And so I based my entire uh, dissertation on that. And so um, the wonderful thing about revenue management is that it's, it literally is the newest discipline in the world of hotels and events and even in even commerce, you know, the dynamic pricing. And so that's um, just a little bit about my background and why, you know, I'm so passionate. Hopefully it comes through in my presentation today about revenue management and why it's so important. And, you know, we're, we're, we're in a changing world, even before the pandemic, um, where, where things are, are just uh, changing all the time and especially pricing. So um, again, I know that many of you have some exposure to revenue management and some of this at the beginning will seem basic, but I just want to talk about, you know, what a revenue manager is, particular in a hotel, but not always in a hotel. Um, we're seeing more and more companies adopt revenue management strategies for pricing. And um, um, I will give you an example in just a minute, but the revenue manager is the individual or team responsible for ensuring that a company's prices match, you know, the consumer's willingness to pay. Um, and these should always be customer driven. We have to remember um, in revenue management that, you know, we, we, we have several goals that we want to accomplish at the same time. And, it, and many years ago, when we were called yield managers, um, you know, we had one goal and that was to get as much revenue as possible. But if you have that one goal, sometimes you make a mistake. And I'll, I'll give you an example in that um, if you, your one goal is to collect as much revenue as possible, um, you could theoretically um, gouge the customer or charge such a high price that they say, yes, you'll get my money this time, but I will never come back to your hotel because I feel like uh, you took advantage of me. Or in, in the case, you know, again, my, my research has to do with cancellation policies. If you try to restrict them, for example, if um, um, let's say you were gonna stay at the Marriott this weekend and one of your, your close family members dies you call the hotel and you say, look, I was planning on staying with this weekend, but I've, I've got to go to a funeral. And the hotel seems unsympathetic or doesn't want to work with you. Um, they'll say, you know, the hotel could say, well, we're sorry for your loss, but we're still going to charge you the full amount for coming in this weekend. Um, that's what we agreed upon. And that's, that's what we're going to charge you. Um, you may, you may pay that cancellation policy you may pay that, that, uh, that amount, but I guarantee you the next time you go to book business in a hotel, you will never ever book in that hotel again. So you can, you can achieve the short term goal of obtaining the maximum revenue, but how much money did you just lose by losing that customer for a lifetime? You may gain that $200 in revenue, but that customer may theoretically spend, you know, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars in the future, and you have no chance of getting any of that revenue. And so, this is when we talk about being consumer driven, um, and we talk a lot about fairness. And in situations like that, um, you have to take everything into account. Not only the short-term goal of maximizing the revenue. But you also have to think about how do we keep that customer for life? And so that, you know, we get not only their business today, 
but tomorrow and the next year and the year after that. And so the role of revenue management basically evolved from yield management and yield management just was singularly focused on let's get the highest, the most money we can get out of that one interaction with the customer. And even if it damages our relationships with that customer, we don't care because we're maximizing, you know, the revenue. So the, the current trend in revenue management now is to take into account, you know, the customer's entire spending or potential spending with you, not next week, not the week after that, but over the lifetime. And this is kind of that relationship management. And so revenue managers, while they do a lot of quantitative numbers, which is something that I love, you also have to be empathetic and be customer driven um, and be, be a judge sometimes and what's fair and what's not fair. And so um, that, that has evolved the position. And so um, I think that, that, that that's very fascinating. And if, if you don't remember anything else from this lecture is, you know, if you ever become a revenue manager, don't think about the short term, think about the long-term relationship with that customer. And there's many things that you could do um, to achieve your short goal of maximizing revenue and also um, facilitating a long-term relationship with that customer. So, by the way, I know you all are on here um, and I'm, you know, we have several, um, we have a lot of attendees actually, which is great, I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, please feel free to use your chat box if you have a question or if you want to comment on something i'll open up my chat box and watch that but i am going to um, save some time at the end of this presentation to allow uh, for some discussion so um, if, if, if you're really excited about something and you want to talk about it put it in the chat and if i don't get to it right now i will get to it during the discussions portion okay all right so again um, some basic stuff here as far as revenue management, you know, we achieve our goals through basically strategic pricing. And, and if you've had the revenue management class, you know that, that you know, pricing um, is very important, um, especially finding that right price. And so we call this strategic pricing. And it, the, the purpose is to, again, maximize revenue, but not drive the price up so high that we lose potential business. And so that really is a skill that revenue managers um, need to develop. And there are many tools out there to help you develop that. And that's why you take the revenue management class is to learn all those tools. But, but, but of course, you know, we have to look at finding the right price. And one of the definitions of, um, you know, revenue management I was given many years ago was selling the right product at the right price at the right time. And so, you know, those variables change and prices, you know, are uh, change accordingly. And so, um, again, you know, I, I talk to my class and we talk about the importance of pricing. The first thing is that prices act as a signal to buyers and sellers. Um, and well, what does this mean? This means that as, as you know, the part of the, part of the four Ps um, you know, price is one of them. And you're telling your consumers many things when you give them a price. And uh, I, um, you know, um, in my research, I've, I've found out something interesting. And um, if you start discounting your rooms, you know, according to the law of supply and demand, right? Um, theoretically, as you discount your price or you drop off your price for say a hotel room, you know, demand is going to go up, right? There's the, you know, supply and demand curve. But in my, my research, and particularly in part of my dissertation, um, I found out something interesting. There's a point at which where you discount, the more you discount, that demand actually starts to go down which seems to contradict the laws of supply and demand. In other words, let's say if you, if, you, um, if you discount your hotel room $20, you might get an additional $100 or 100 reservations. If you discount your hotel 
$40, right? You might get another additional 100 reservations after that, giving you 200. If you discount your hotel by $60, it actually stays flat. And in some cases, the demand actually goes down. And so, you know, that would, again, seems to contradict the law of supply and demand until you factor in consumer behavior. And many of you right now, hopefully, have figured out the reason why demand goes down um, when, when you give too much of a discount. Is anybody, I'll take a volunteer right now, actually. Um, who, who, wants to, who wants to tell me why? Um, okay, Christian? Yes, please. You can either type it in or, uh, or come on, come off microphone. Hi. Hi, how are, Hi, how you? are you? Nice to meet you. Um, uh, I, was, I was thinking like uh, demand goes down because I don't know, like people think that they're going to lose service or they're going to lose certain factors of, of attention or if it's going to be just like a plain, simple stay and nothing more. And I think that's a factor that you think first because it's too cheap, isn't it? Uh, I'm wondering. Yeah, but you I, nailed I'm it, not... actually. That is, that is the exact answer, um, or that's what I found my research showed. And, uh, and okay, I can cool. sum it up in, in one, you know, one sentence. It's too good of a discount. What's wrong with the product? And you're exactly right. Is uh, the yeah. service off? Is, is, are you renovating? Yeah. I, why are you giving me such a good deal? And it's, you know, the old axiom of you get what you pay for. And so absolutely, you can, you can discount too much. And so this just reaffirms, you know, our first bullet point here, that price acts as a signal to both the buyers and the sellers. Basically, if you discount too much, you're sending a signal to the buyer, something is wrong. You're getting a discount that's not, readily apparent that I sh that you shouldn't be getting. So um, yes, price does act as a signal to both the buyers and the seller. Um, prices do encourage efficient production. Um, again, law of su supply and demand says, you're gonna put your time and effort into what gets you the most revenue, the most profitable. And so um, many um, hotels, and I've been involved in feasibility studies before, and you know, business owners um, want to expand and they want to know where they should expand. And your first question is, is probably the simplest one, but the most important in, well, you know, <laughs> what are people buying? You know, what, what, what product or what service gets you the most revenue, gets you the highest profitability? And that's probably where you should look to expand. And then of course, prices help to ration scarce resources. Um, and I, I don't know what's, how it's going down there in Colombia, but um, every time bad news comes out about the pandemic. This uh, is Ecuador, Scott. Huh? We're in Ecuador, not in Colombia. Oh, Ecuador, I'm sorry, uh, in, in Ecuador. Um, well, that's, um, okay. that's okay, yeah. we're, we, we, were, we were all one big thing. <laughs> yeah. one no, thing. no, no, I know there's a big difference there, so. Um, <laughs> Um, as soon as there's bad news about the pandemic, you know, toilet paper demand goes crazy. And of course, you know, what, the, what do the stores do to, um, to, to compensate for that? They raise the prices there. And so uh, revenue management happens not only in hotels and airlines, but also, um, you know, for, for common goods. And so at the beginning of my presentation, I told you, um, I was just going to give you an, uh, an example of what, um, you know, um, revenue management being used in areas that traditionally have not been used. And so um, I drive around town here it, there, in Colombia, my election, the city I'm in actually right now is Colombia, and that's why I've got Colombia on the brain. Um, but I drive around Colombia and I, and I take my truck and I've actually got a really big truck because my wife has me do a lot of projects. So it's, it uses a lot of gas. And so I'm very, very conscious the price of gas. And so I'll be driving around in the morning and I will look 
and I will see, let's say that my, my local gas station that I like, um, you know, um, charges $2 for a gallon and, and I'll, I'll drive down the street and I'll do my, my work and my errands and I'll drive back and around, uh, 1030 in the morning, the price has actually dropped. And so instead of $2, it's a dollar 90. And so I, you know, I think to myself, um, well, this is just, you know, the, the, the price change came today, and so it'll be $1.90 the rest of the week, right? And so tomorrow morning I get up and I'm driving by the gas station, you know, again at 9 o'clock in the morning, and it's $2. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, it was, you know, one ninety five yesterday at 10.30. And then again, I drive by at 10.30 in the morning, and the, the price has dropped again. And so what, you, what we're seeing here is it gas stations, which we, tr we traditionally don't think of gas stations as employing revenue management, right? The price of a gallon stays pretty consistent and it may change it once a week. <coughs> what we're seeing now is that gas stations have figured out uh, the law of supply and demand. You know what, at nine o'clock in the morning, you have a lot of people rushing to get to work on time. And if they're low on gas, they will pay the higher rate because they have to get to work on time. But at 1030, the demand for gas and the gas pumps is reduced greatly. In fact, you know, at nine o'clock, you have to wait in line to get in gas. But um, in, um, you know, 1030, you know, people like me who, who are not at work that, you know, have a, have a looser schedule, you know, will wait till that time. And so, we are seeing gas stations actually employ revenue management, changing maybe just five cents, which some people think is, a, is not a big deal. It's a real big deal to help adjust for that supply and demand. And so now we see more and more um, places that traditionally didn't use revenue management are now using revenue management. And of course, you know, other, other places have been using revenue management long before hotels began looking at it. And I always think of, um, again, you know, um, happy hour, right? Do you all have happy hours and, and, you know, at the local bars and clubs? Well, sure. I mean, they, you know, two for one drinks or whatever, you know, at, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon. Why? Because no one wants to go to a bar or a club at five o'clock. You know, things don't start happening until, and it's been a while since I've been at a bar or a club, but I'm thinking, you know, back when I used to go, you, you know, 10 o'clock, you know, was probably early and you can correct me if I'm wrong there, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, uh, restaurants, early bird specials, right? From four to 6 PM, that's revenue management. That is absolutely revenue management in action and, and trying to take a very slow period, a slow demand period, and encourage people to shift their demand to that period. And of course, if you go, um, you know, I'm giving my age away here, um, but I love, I love early bird because, you know, my wife and I like to eat early now. I'm not a senior citizen yet, um, but I'm, I'm very motivated by saving money, especially on going out to eat. And so, um, you know, we see the development of revenue management in that, it has been around for a long time. Again, think of the happy hour, the early bird. We just didn't call it revenue management back then. Then there's sort of the present, which involves mostly hotels and airlines. And then there's the future. And the future is even items that we've considered um, to be, you know, static pricing. You know, we're starting to involve revenue management now. And I'll, I'll give you one last example and that we have a department store here called Kohl's. And um, Kohl's is actually, it's, it's retail. And again, we typically don't think of retail as, as, as demand-based pricing. We tend to think of it as very static. A shirt, you know, it's $25. A shirt is, and that doesn't change. Um, but Kohl's actually does this thing and they actually, um, and here's another current trend, they're using big data. 
And so one of the things that, that, that um, I do, my wife likes to shop at Kohl's, is that you sign up for their club or their frequent buyers club. Sometimes, you know, in airlines, we call them frequent flyers or um, in hotels, they're, they're loyalty clubs. Um, but what they do is they collect data on you. They, they identify you as a unique consumer and they start to collect data on you. And um, Kohl's is a good example where they will target you specifically through their big data and they will send you coupons through the mail in order to get you to buy something. And I'll give you an example. Um, I, I'm a runner. Um, and I like running shoes. I just am just fascinated by, by running shoes, you know, Adidas and Under Armour and Nike and all that. And that's, uh, I, I, it's just fascinating to me. Um, Kohl's has discovered this somehow. Um, I bought some running shoes there in the past and they also collected data from me on, you know, what are your interests or whatever. And so some sitting somewhere in a computer database for Kohl's is the name Scott Smith and below it is actionable items or data. When we say actionable, they know what they need to do to encourage me to go and buy something. And so what I will get is I will get specific coupons for Scott Smith that say on Tuesday, if you come and shop in our store on Tuesday and for, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's very similar to where you're at. Um, on Tuesday, the, um, you can get 20% off running shoes, but only on Tuesday. Can't bring it in on the weekend when we have high demand. But if you come in on this slow day, we'll give you a specific discount. And so that's enough to motivate me to get up um, in the middle of my busy day and make sure that I go to Kohl's on Tuesday and buy you know, a specific set of running shoes. And so this is a trend we're seeing again, um, far beyond hotels, far beyond airlines. We are seeing that even um, merchandise locations are starting to employ revenue management techniques. So uh, that's really good news for those of us who are studying revenue management because the jobs will be there. And that's something that I, I again, if, if you know, if you want to take away something from this class or this lecture, and I tell this to all my students, if you have a talent for revenue management, is this is something that interests you and you understand numbers and analysis, you will always have a job. There are going to be so many jobs in the future that are going to focus on revenue management and analysis. And even in places that are that you would not think about, like I said, you know, we always think about hotels or airlines or cruise lines or whatever. But more and more, you're seeing retail stores and services and banks and all of these industries out there will start to employ revenue management techniques. And so um, I highly encourage you, if this is, you know, a topic that's that's that speaks to you that you feel like you have a talent for, um, I highly encourage you to develop this skill and go out and, and market yourself as a revenue manager or revenue analyst, because I'm telling you, that's where a lot of the job growth is going to come from, um, from all of the industries out there. And so, um, yes, please, I think, um, absolutely develop the skill. And I will say this, part of the other reason um, and, and, and if, if this is something you don't like or you're not very good at, that's, that's not a problem. There are plenty of other jobs out there. But just in my years of doing this, I would say maybe five to 10% of the population can do this job and do it well. Um, it, you really have to be numbers driven. You have to be able not only to understand numbers and you know, it, it gets interesting because if you hire someone who's only numbers driven, Sometimes they have very poor communication skills and they may know everything and they may understand it, but they have a terrible time trying to explain it to other people or their bosses or making presentations. So 
kind of that magic, you know, if you did a Venn diagram of what makes a good revenue manager, I would say having not only the analytical skills, understanding numbers, but also having those soft skills of being able to communicate that either written or verbally and be able to make presentations. And also um, there are many times when I was a revenue manager, um, I had to also be a salesperson because I had a strategy that I knew would work that I wanted to implement, but people were skeptical of it and they didn't want to take that chance. And so I had to figure out, you know, how to make that presentation, how to sell this strategy to, you know, the managers in order to, to get it implemented. And so if you have those, those skills, those two skills, right? If you're kind of in the middle of that Venn diagram there, then I, I highly, highly encourage you to develop, you know, revenue management skills and tools, learn as much as you can, um, <clears throat> practice it and just get comfortable with it. And, and you will always have a job. And so um, I, I, um, for my class, when I teach revenue management, I, I'm able to, to basically pick the people who are really good at it and make phone calls to hotel companies and say, I've got another one for you. And, and for the most part, they get hired right away simply because they're always looking for good people. It's not a position that you can put someone in um, who doesn't have that skill. They can do a lot of damage. So, all right, well, we're, we're moving right along here. Um, and again, this is probably going a little bit back to the basics, but um, you know, why again, do, is revenue management so important to hotels and, and, and restaurants and airlines? And if you've taken the class and you know, um, you know the concept of constrained supply. And constrained supply just basically is a, is a fancy economic term for, you can't readily create you know, more product overnight. Um, and so I always, and I'm a hotel guy. And so I always think of hotels, um, you know, and I, I tell my class, you know, some days in hotel management, there's no demand and you're lucky to fill 50%. In other days, if you had, you know, three times the number of rooms that you have, you could easily fill them. So the, the demand goes up and down quite frequently. And that's what we mean by constrained supply in that um, let's say you have a hundred room hotel and the demand tomorrow night is 200 rooms. You can't easily build another 200 rooms to accommodate, you know, the demand, the supply is constrained, it's fixed. And so it's important to adjust your strategy accordingly. And it's even more important. Um, I always tell the, the, the story of, um, if you work in a hotel and you're at the front desk, you, you, you know that, or you should know, um, if someone walks in late at night, right? And your hotel has plenty of rooms to sell. Um, and a customer walks up and says, well, how much is a room? And you say, let's say a hundred dollars. And that customer starts to walk out. <laughs> you know, not to let them walk out the door, right? You, you, you play a game with them called let's make a deal because you're going to lose that customer. There's no one else that's going to walk in through that door that's going to take one of your hotel rooms. And so, you know, I used to train my people to, to, to basically play, you know, find a discount. Well, you know, are you a member of AAA? AAA is American Automobile Association. Um, are you, you know, are you military? Are you government? Or find a reason to give them a discounted rate. Because I always say in my class, you know, um, if, you're, if, you're, if your rooms are $100, um, $75 is better than $0, right? It's better to, uh, to get some money than no money at all. And so that's because of the constrained supply situation. Um, the, you know, the opposite of that is, let's say you go to the supermarket or your local market and there's a can of tuna fish on the shelf and it's a dollar. And you take that can of tuna fish and you go to the manager of the store and you say to them, look, it's, I know the price is a dollar, but I'll give you 75 cents for it, right? What's the manager gonna say to you? 
And they're going to say, get out of my store. I'm not. No, that's, that's crazy. The price is the dollar, right? And so why is the manager of the supermarket um, not going to deal with you when the front desk clerk or the front desk manager is going to make a deal with you? And, you know, you probably know that the answer in that is, hey, it, again, we talked about the, the room is going to disappear. The opportunity to sell that room is going to disappear. But that can of tuna fish can sit on, you know, the shelf for a day, for two days, for a week, for a couple of weeks. And somebody is going to pay a dollar for that tuna fish. So there is really no incentive for you to play let's make a deal with something that can be held over or sold you know, tomorrow, the next day, or the day after that. Hotel rooms, airline seats, uh, cruise lines, they all have constrained supply. And of course, you know, the, the minute that, you know, that, that night is over, you've lost the opportunity to sell that hotel room. So um, this is why revenue managers at hotels um, and airlines, you know, have an even more difficult task because they have to do it every night. Every single day, their supply gets zeroed out and they start all over again. Whereas if you're selling tuna fish or even automobiles, right? Um, if you don't sell it today, you have the opportunity to sell it tomorrow. And so um, that's what revenue management is, is basically about. So I'm gonna jump ahead actually pretty quickly here. Um, because some of the things we talked about. So, um, so what are the big changes in the lodging industry that um, that have revenue managers um, worried, concerned about? And uh, you know, obviously, this uh, the first thing right now, obviously, is about the pandemic. <laughs> So if you take that out of the equation, and I'm not gonna talk about that because <clears throat> actually next week I'm going to a conference uh, for revenue management ed educators where all we're gonna do is talk about the effects of the pandemic. So if I gave this lecture to you two weeks from today, it would be a different topic. But right now I'm gonna talk about pre-pandemic and what's happening out in the lodging world. And, and of course, um, I think everyone would not be surprised to hear that the lodging shared economy or the shared economy, or people just typically just say Airbnb, right, has had a tremendous effect on hotels and the hotel company. And um, it is interesting that the alarm bell bells have actually been going off for a long time for the hotel industry, and they ignored it. They simply ignored Airbnb and said, oh, it's just a small fad. It's not really gonna affect our business. The people that go to an Airbnb um, aren't, aren't our customers. And uh, of course, you know, time has shown that is definitely not the case, that um, there have been some studies that show um, that Airbnb and the lodging shared economy uh, vacation real by our owner VRBO and I, there's several other companies out there have absolutely had an effect on hotels and the economy and you can see um, I always go to the Penn State report which basically says um, in September of 2015 um, versus September of 2014 there has been a huge increase um, in Airbnb traffic and this and when when Airbnb are in um, lodging shared economy revenue went up over this time period, actually rates and occupancy went down for hotels in 12 cities. And so although, you know, correlation doesn't always mean causation, this this clearly Airbnb is having an effect on people. Um, and I just look at myself. Um, when I travel on business, I absolutely stay at a hotel because it's not my money. You know, the business is paying for it. But when I'm traveling by myself, now my wife won't stay at an Airbnb, so that's a different situation. But um, 
three years ago, I went to Paris for my, by myself and um, I absolutely stayed in an Airbnb. Um, and I'm the, I'm the biggest fan of hotels there are out there. And so they were even able to convince me to try out Airbnb. And so um, hotels have to figure this out and they have to uh, take this threat seriously because it, it is affecting what their, their business. And uh, hotels have tried some interesting things. Um, let me show you real quick here. Um, hotels, when they finally realized that the lodging shared economy was a threat, um, they made some moves and they created what is known as a lifestyle brand of hotels. And uh, you can see here that Marriott put together Moxie Hotels, Starwood, Aloft, uh, you know, Red Hotels, uh, and Daz. These are all what are called lifestyle hotels, which kind of, they try to give it kind of a hip vibe, try to convince people that, um, you know, that, that they can be as cool as Airbnb. Um, and you can see here what a lifestyle hotel is. Um, and you can read that, I'm not gonna read it for you, but it basically is something that's supposed to be cool. Because I think um, part of the allure of the Airbnb, and they do a really good job of marketing. Um, and I can remember a advertisement they did not too long ago, that basically says, don't you know, stay in a city, you know, live like a local. And they're basically appealing to people who wanna get away from this kind of safe, plastic tourism and go for more of an authentic experience. And so hotels are trying to generate that. I will say this though, and this is, this is funny because I can remember there was a conference that we did and when Marriott was trying to put together their brand Moxty um, and they, they showed, they brought the development team and to, to talk about what they're developing. And I had to laugh and it probably wasn't kind. And, you know, I used to work for Marriott, so uh, I love the company. But if you looked at the development team, the people putting Moxie hotels together, um, they looked like me, 50 year old white guys. And, you know, they were, they were trying to tell everybody what cool is or what's hip. And you, you just have to laugh at the irony of it. They're, they're trying to manufacture cool or hip and you know and as we're going to talk about you know the um airbnb is really driven by the millennials and the younger people um that's who's where the growth is and part of it is that cool or hip factor and the last thing a millennial wants to hear from is a 50 year old white guy is what's cool and hip and so um i just thought that that was funny we're going to see if this works for those hotels um, I've stayed at them. I actually like them, you know, but again, I'm a 50 year old white guy and it was, you know, developed by 50 year old white guys. And so this is um, part of that, that hip factor um, or the brand factor. The other thing, of course, and this is the million dollar question, and this really comes back to revenue management as opposed to marketing is, you know, we all agree that, and you can, we'll go to the, um, you know, the, um, whoops, hung too far. We, you know, we talk about the growth and uh, lodging shared economy um, is driven by the millennials and their, their rise into the economy. And so here's the million dollar question. And if, if I knew the answer to this, I would take all my money and invest it one way or another and I'd be a billionaire. But I don't know the answer to this. And that is, you know, millennials are cost conscious right now because they're just entering into the workforce and they've got, you know, nice paying jobs, but they haven't reached their, their income potential. And so the million dollar question, and if you know the answer to this, please, you know, take advantage of it, use it, is to uh, answer the question, is this a lifestyle thing or is this a permanent change? In other words, let me rephrase that. Is this, um, the fact that, hey, I'm just saving money because I don't make a whole lot of money. So I'm saving money by staying in an Airbnb or a lodging shared economy. And once I start to, to really move up in the, the earnings, 
am I going to trade for hotel and comfort and brand security uh, versus is this something that's going to stay with them, you know, the rest of their lives? And so if we're going to have a discussion question, I'd love to hear from you all because you probably know better than I am. Is this something that is here to stay that is really going to bite into, you know, the hotel expansion, um, especially now with the pandemic? Um, I thought that the LSEs, LSEs may be hurt. And I told my, my friends in the hotel industry, um, here's your opportunity to really gain up a competition against, say, Airbnb, because the one thing that your hotel has is brand standards, particularly when it comes to cleaning and by extension sanitation. And so people who may have felt comfortable staying at Airbnb before may not be comfortable now because who's, who's cleaning that room? You know, um, is, is it cleaned by the owner who maybe had a bad day and doesn't want to clean? And this gives me more exposure to the pandemic. Whereas if I go to a hotel and I actually consult with hotels and I've been telling them since day one, you know, every, your traditional marketing is out the window. Now you have to emphasize your cleaning standards and, and all the 86 points that you do to clean a room after one guest checks out and before another guest checks in because people want to feel safe and they want to feel like their room has been sanitized against this pandemic. And that's a real thing. And so um, it's going to be interesting to see um, how this, this comes about, but I will say, um, we're not seeing the dramatic effect that I thought we would see in fall off for Airbnb and the lodging shared economy. People are still going. Uh, this is driven by millennials again, and there might be a factor. And again, I don't know the answer to this. And so I'll open it up for discussion here in a second, but is it, you know, millennials really kind of feel bulletproof about, you know, the pandemic. And um, so they may not alter their, their buying behavior when it comes to Airbnb in the lodging shared economy. And so um, this is perfect. I'm actually one minute over. I wanted to save about 10 minutes for discussion. So we're nine minutes in discussion. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the floor for uh, discussions here. This is, you know, the end of my presentation. Hold on, let me get to it. Um, so yeah, who wants, to, who wants to weigh in on anything I've said um, with regards to revenue management? Don't be shy. Thank you very much, Scott. So uh, we're gonna have uh, some questions coming in uh, anytime now. So the, the first thing that, I, that comes into my mind, uh, when you began your presentation saying something about you have to balance maximizing revenue and, uh, and the, uh, the customer uh, loyalty and having a customer for life, right? Yes. So that can be a little bit difficult. Uh, how, 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 in practice, how do you do that? Um, well, first of all, that's a great question. And, and I wish I have some ideas, <laughs> but again, if I knew exactly the right formula, you know, we could be millionaires, Damien. Um, but it, it has to do with, with big data and being able to track customers and their potential um, so that's, that's kind of the revenue management side, but there's also a human side to it. And again, there, it's very different. Um, if someone wants to cancel, you know, their, their hotel stay because, you know, they've lost a relative versus someone calling and saying, look, I found a better price. I'm, I'm, you know, going to cancel my reservation. This, that's the human equation to it. And so, you know, it's interesting when you're a revenue manager, you look at numbers all day. But there comes a point where you, you have to make a good business decision that is not based on numbers, although it does have a number effect. Like I say, if you, if you make a customer so mad that they never, ever want to come back to your hotel, then you're missing out on potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so um, it really is a case by case. You almost have to err on the side of, um, you know, <clears throat> of being lenient. Just, 
you know, and I know people, people call all the time and they lie. And I honestly, I, in my region, I had, I had one revenue manager and he was a great revenue manager, but he literally told people, if you send me a copy of the death certificate, then I will allow you, you know, to cancel your reservation. And I, and Damien, your, your reaction is exactly my reaction. Oh my God. How, how could you, you know, <laughs> how could you be that, that insensitive? Um, and so people get over on you all the time. Um, I'm sure people lie all the time to get out of reservations, but you know, and I also teach guest service management. Are you going to worry about the 10% of the people who are trying to get over on you and trying to cheat you? Are you going to worry about the 90% of the honest customers, the good loyal customers um, that, um, that appreciate, you know, you're helping them out and you, you always want to go with the 90%. And so, yeah, people are going to cheat, you know, you know, you're, you're instructor as well. You get students come to you all the time that, you know, have these excuses as to why, you know, they can't do this or that. And they're, you know, their, their grandmother died three times in the semester. And, you know, it, um, you, you, you kind of have to be that judge um, where that's at. But I always try to err on the, ca the side of caution and remember that that's a future customer. You don't want to, you don't want to drive them away, but um, you also don't want to be taken advantage of. So does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. But uh, how do you, I mean, you, you know what to do. So how, but you are not the one in front of the guests all the time, right? The revenue manager or the manager. And since you have so much experience in operations, what do you think is best? Like how, how do you uh, empower, how do you transmit the, the your, your employee? You've also worked in Disney. I know you have many, uh, many, many, many policies. Um, I don't know, it's, is it a matter of hiring, of communication, or what do you think works best uh, from your perspective? Again, since you have uh, both the revenue manager and the, and the managerial aspect of the operation. All of the above. <laughs> but, you, but you said the magic word, empowerment. Um, and I was with Marriott when they rolled out empowerment. And you, you, you know, if you, if you trust your employees and let them know you trust them, you give them the right training, you give them the right background, they're typically going to do the right thing. Now, um, it was interesting when they first had rolled out empowerment um, many years ago, it was unlimited. You could comp a guest's entire stay. You could, I mean, there, you know, there was no limit as to what you could do to compensate. Now companies have kind of said, uh, Disney included, um, you know, there's a $500 limit on, on you know, those type of decisions. Okay. If, it's, if it's excess of $500, you need to involve a higher level manager, which you probably want to do anyways, because if you've got a problem that's over $500, somebody really needs to look into it and address it, especially if it's systemic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a situation like that, a revenue manager, you're kind of the champion and you go to the front desk clerks, you go to the front desk manager and say, look, here's our policy. Here's our philosophy. You know, if, if, if you want to make that decision and take care of that guest, as long as it doesn't cost us more than 200, 300, 500, whatever the amount is, then you're empowered to do it. Um, especially if it's for, you know, keeping a guest long term. Um, if it's if it's over that amount, then yeah, you you need to get me involved in that decision. I understand. Thank you very much, Camila. I don't know if we have uh, any questions or. Okay, then I'm gonna ask a question uh, sure. for the students again, okay? Uh, so if you are a, a young professional and you see like you're just graduating, right? From, uh, from undergrad and, uh, and you are interested in, in revenue management, what are the next steps? Because it can be also a little bit uh, worrying or even sad to be uh, in, in an industry that has taken this big of a hit. Uh, so what would be your recommendation, uh, like going to, to a graduate program, like the one you, you, uh, you, you have and you manage, or uh, should you work on other industries? What, what would be your honest recommendation for? for I'm so glad you asked that because I, I, I tell my students this all the time and, and 
I can look all of you in the eye and say this with absolute conviction. Um, I've been through this many times, not pandemics, but I've been through wars. I've been through great recessions. I've been through economic downturns. And one thing is always clear. We come back and we come back stronger than ever. In other words, um, and I just read an article this morning that talked about pent up demand for 2021. And if you're not familiar with pent up demand, it basically goes something like, look, we put all our vacations off for 2021 or 2020, and maybe even into 2021. When things get better, we are gonna go out and we're gonna, I, my wife and I are a perfect example. We're typically in Europe this time of year. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sad <laughs> because right now I would be probably in Paris um, teaching students, by the way. Um, and I've had to put that off. And so I've told my wife, as soon as it's clear and it's safe to go, honey, we're, we're going and we're traveling. We're gonna forget all about COVID for two weeks and we are, you know, we've saved up money and we're going out. And so um, I honestly believe that the industry is going to snap back and it's probably going to snap back fairly quickly, especially since these vaccines are coming out. And so um, all this pent up demand is going to drive a lot of business. And what has happened, and I know this for a fact because I talked to all my friends in industry is that a lot of people have left the industry, retired, gotten out of it, um, moved on to something else. Mm -hmm. And so when the hiring starts again, it is gonna be like you've never seen before. There are gonna be so many hotels, um, hiring again, restaurants. Cruise lines might be the exception. There's some some problems built in the cruise lines um, that I don't really have time to go into, but between hotels and restaurants, you are gonna see hiring like you've never never seen before. And uh, hopefully you won't have you know, a pick of a job, you'll have a pick of several jobs. And so the best advice I can give to you, and you know, <laughs> you're doing it right now, is educate yourself. Take this time to educate yourself whether it be take additional classes, get another degree, or certificates. Hotels mm -hmm. love certificates. Uh, we have, if you're familiar, the Chia certificate, which yes, is we're a part of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of Chia, yes. Wow, that's amazing. That speaks so highly of you. You should be educating yourself because I'm gonna tell you right now, this is how it's gonna go. And I've been in this position before. You're gonna go, you're gonna go back and say, we need to hire people. And you're going to have two candidates, candidate A and candidate B. And you're going to say to candidate A, what did you do while you were furloughed, while you were, uh, you know, didn't have a job? And candidate A says, oh, I just kind of hung out, um, maybe sat on the couch, watched TV, you know, um, I just waited for the phone to ring. Then candidate B is going to say, look, during that time, I took a class. I got certified in this, I, I did this, I bettered myself. And I could go with everyone right now and answer the question and all of you are gonna tell me the same thing. Who are you gonna hire? Clearly candidate B because they have initiative, they know that things are gonna get better and they're preparing themselves for when that happens. So. In all honesty, you guys are right where you need to be right now. Obviously, you're in class, you're getting educated, you're bettering yourself, and you need to wear that as a badge of pride. When you go out and you're looking for a job, you need to clearly communicate sometime within that interview. Look, during the pandemic, I didn't have a job, but I was going to school, I was taking classes, I was learning this, and I was learning back, I was learning that this will speak so highly about you, you will stand out in the interview. And so again, I keep saying this, if you don't remember anything else, <laughs> remember this, but remember that you are right where you need to be right now. And if it takes a little bit longer for people to start to hiring, keep taking classes, keep learning. Even if you graduate, take a graduate class, do something so that when 
you finally do get that interview, you can say that whole time I was bettering myself. I was developing this skill and I was developing that skill. And trust me, that interview is going to, that interviewer is going to take notice of that and you will stand out amongst the people. Thank you very much, Scott. I, I totally agree. Uh, having a, a, a hospitality uh, certificate on, on industry analytics, on Excel, maybe, I don't know if you have some uh, revenue management certificates, maybe HSMI or something like that, would you recommend? The Chia is, is the industry standard out there right now. And they're actually developing another uh, certification called CATA, mm -hmm. C-A-T, C-H-A-T-A. -A. Um, actually, Steve Hood will be on the, in the conference Oh, great. Next week. Yeah. And he's the grandfather, the guy that in charge of all their, their education certification. Um, but those are the two that we absolutely, if you want to do hotel uh, revenue management and analytics, it, it's going to get to the point fairly soon where you pretty much have to have that. And that says, you know, you understand the star report, how to do competitive analysis, um, all the things that are the tools are a good revenue manager needs. And so, um, and again, if you're interested in revenue management, I highly encourage you to get those because that's where a lot of the growth is going to come from. I really, I sincerely believe that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. We actually do, we, we hosted last year one of those certifications uh, back in, in our university. And I'm going to look at, at this uh, a new certificate uh, Probably with Dwayne, he, he helped us yeah. uh, with this. So thank you very much, Scott. Uh, Camila, yes, please. Have okay. one last question. Yes, the question is, what's the first step independent hotels should consider when they don't have neither a revenue management department or the financial tools to develop a system to maximize revenue, man to, sorry, maximize revenue or manage their target market? Hire a revenue manager, hire an experienced revenue manager for the property. Um, a lot of that has to do with the complexity. Like if you're running a hundred room, you know, no suite hotel where all the rooms are, set, are the same, you should still hire a revenue manager, but it doesn't have to be someone who's, um, you know, my level. <laughs> you could get an entry level person right out of college to come in and manage that for you. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you have to have somebody making those decisions and that's a trained revenue manager who can come in, look at, assess the situation, put together a plan and then implement that plan. And that's something, you know, I would expect a college student that took the, you know, a revenue management class, um, should be able to do absolutely. You, you can, you can go into an independent hotel and set something up. Would I have a college student, you know, run a thousand room resort? No, not, <laughs> not for several years, but you know, it, a hundred room independent hotel absolutely needs a revenue manager to assess the situation and implement a plan. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, can I do a follow up quick question for this? Mm -hmm. So for a small hotel, uh, would you recommend outsourcing a service? Uh, and would you, what, and what, I don't know if you have any, any, any tool, like we're not going to use a software like ideas or something for a small hotel. Do you have a, something uh, we can take out of a, that you could, could, can recommend as a software? You know, many of the hotel companies out there are offering their services, even to independent hotels are given in kind of soft brands. And so that's something that's a kind of a higher level decision that an owner would need to make. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it may, and I, I know of a hotel specifically that took a Wyndham brand because they wanted the revenue management system and the reservation system. The brand actually didn't help the hotel. The hotel did, had great demand. And so when they put Wyndham sign on there, they made it really small <laughs> and put it, you know, in the bottom left-hand side of the sign because they weren't emphasizing the Wyndham brand, but the, what they wanted were the systems. And so that would be a consideration. There are plenty of hotel chains out there that allow you a soft brand, but, it, but gives you access to reservation systems and to professional revenue management services. And that's something that, that, that should be looked at. It doesn't have to be Marriott or Hilton. Like I say, um, you know, there are other great hotel brands out there. 
um, that are not part of the big guys that can help you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. This has been great. I have learned a lot. And I really like that your, your message for your, our students uh, and for the industry, uh, it's quite positive. It's quite positive. And that's, that's a very good thing because it leaves us uh, having a better day now and a better yeah. So yeah, Hang in there, guys. You know, this too shall pass. And so um, I know it's tough, but, but trust me, you are right where you need to be right now. You are right where you need to be taking classes and bettering yourself. And when this thing turns around, you're going to have a distinct advantage. And so better times are coming. I promise. Um, I've been through this. And uh, if I, if, if I didn't believe that I'd, I'd have to get out of the business. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Scott. It's been, it's been great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Camila. And thanks uh, all of you guys uh, for being here. Uh, thank you for the question again also. Uh, and uh, we'll see you uh, next week. And Scott, uh, probably you could consider uh, Galapagos instead of Paris next time. You'll be our guest and we can do something on revenue management for the cruise and hotel industry in the Galapagos. I would absolutely love that. I, I love to travel and see new places. And I guarantee you if I, if I would pick Galapagos over Paris next time because I've been to Paris but I haven't been to the Galapagos, so. We have to plan something. I know David, uh, David Cardenas is coming up, hopefully, uh, well, one year from now, uh, in the late uh, 2021. So uh, we can do something, and we can also find some collaboration uh, for your, the graduate programs you have and, and, and what we have here. I would love that. Thank you all. And, um, you know, thanks for giving me your time today. And, and Damien, I'm gonna send you that information on the conference, okay? Please we'll do it later well. on that if we need to, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you. Ciao, Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye, Scott. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, Scott. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Be safe.